I think in the 70s when they were doing the thalamide studies and we started seeing all the birth defects, that's when they put the kibosh on studying women, especially pregnant women. And then NIH started looking at the data that was coming out, bone density research and cardiovascular research, all that was being done on men who were being supplied with estrogen. It's like, that is not adequate. Even mouse studies were all done on male rats. A lot of times we're so obsessed with my waistline, my butt size, weight, but you've, you've shifted this conversation. Okay, we have all these things in place for boys, but we need to open the conversation up to girls to normalize what is a period, to normalize what is movement, to normalize what it means to be a girl in today's society. She isn't in menopause yet. She's 20 to 40. She's in the working world. There's a reality. In a perfect world, what, would she, what buckets would she be trying to hit? I think the big rock for everyone is so today we have the wonderful Dr. Stacy Sims joining us. Stacy is the exercise physiologist and nutrition scientist who changed the way the industry really thought about women in exercise with her TED talk called Women Are Not Small Men. And since then, Dr. Sims has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers on the topic of physiology and exercise. One of the things I always appreciated is I learned from her that athletic women actually perform better fed than fasted. And in our conversation, we really go into detail about how we can transform our bodies from like tired, sluggish, and weak to resilient and strong, whether we're a man or a woman. So let's get into it with Dr. Stacy Sims. Dr. Stacy Sims, welcome to the show. Thanks. This is our second time together. And yeah. uh, I have to say it was so funny, like after talking to you the last time, that was probably what, almost three years ago or something. It was so funny because you're in so many ways, you're just so far ahead, especially in the women's studying women's and women's performance. And then you'd slowly start to see things trickling in. Yeah. Um, you know, you've, you've been doing lots and lots of interviews. You have programs and I want to encourage people to, because sometimes some of this does get technical. If people really want some hand holding, they can go to your website and you have programs from not only nutritional, but from movement. Even I saw you have an herb, like, you know, working with like ashwagandha and certain herbs. So I just want to say this at the top of this conversation, if it gets heady for people, you know, little bit by little bit, but in watching you and kind of getting ready for this today, I thought to myself, you've talked so much about performance and fasting and your periods and lifting and nutrition. And then I was like, has anyone asked you lately, just, uh, you know, you doing this for several years now, what's occurring to you? Like what is really, when you take a shower and you kind of are in with your thoughts like what's on your mind about all of this? And it doesn't have to be specifically in only women, but when it comes to like movement and food and all of this stuff, because we are hit constantly with a ton of information. Yeah. And you're right in the middle of it. What is showing up just as a human being for you that feels, if anything, important? And it doesn't have to be, we don't have to have all the studies to support it. But I feel like people like you have instincts about certain things. And it's like you spend so much time talking about this other stuff, but maybe you don't get to talk about something that feels extra important to you. Yeah, I mean, there's two things. One is I'm always referring back to the movie Wally. -E, if you remember from the early 2000s, right? I see the smile. And it's the scene where they have all the floating people on the couch and they're all watching the screen, not paying attention to each other. And one guy gets knocked off by the robot and falls on the ground. All of a sudden is aware of his surroundings, but he can't get up because he doesn't have muscle to get up. He has no idea what's going on. He doesn't know how to move. And I'm like, oh my God, all of society is moving that way. And this was from the early 2000s. Like I look at all the trends that are out there from Ozempic to fasting to 30 plants, you know, all these things that are circulating, but people basically have forgotten what it means to move and to eat well, like the basic fundamentals. I was like, there's so many things that we could unpack, but it just comes down to people forgot how to be just instinctively human with regards to our bodies are designed to move and to fuel for that movement. So that's one big thing that always comes up. And then the other big thing, because my daughter is 12, I always think about 
how there's still so many gender stereotypes with regards to how girls should be, what they should be seeking for activity. You know, I'm in a an, an environment where we have to have school uniforms and they have to do social dance and the girl has to ask the boy and if they don't ask the opposite sex, then, you know, they get detention. I was like, how archaic is that? So I'm always thinking about, okay, we have all these things in place for boys, but we need to open the conversation up to girls to normalize what is a period, to normalize what is movement, to normalize what it means to be a girl in today's society, because mm. we keep referring back to the old school. And I see how damaging it is to all these girls that are coming up because they're repeating the same things that we had to go through. And my fight is that they don't have to. So those are the two ends. Like one is general pop and one is specific on this growing growing population that maybe we can influence so we don't have the Wally population in the future. So that's an interesting point because I have, you know, three daughters and I know it sounds weird, but it almost like it never occurs to me. Like, I, I feel like it's this interesting balance. And I, I feel this way coming from performance. Let's say I come from the sharp end of the stick like you do. Mm -hmm. And it's this weird place that you live in, which is at the end of the day, you can have all these little measurements and we're going to get into some of those, like how much protein right before you train and how much after within the hour to recover different from men and women and all this stuff. But in the end, if you're sort of trying to do all the right things, most of the time, it kind of works out overall, yep. it, it, you know, so I just, I feel like that's really important. And then it's knowing enough about your biology. You know, you, you had that great phrase and whole project around men are not, and women are not small men, right? Mm -hmm. So it's this weird thing of knowing biologically, hey, there's some differences. Obviously, look at the complexity of the system, the hormone system alone. And then also simultaneously going and do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, as a woman, like yeah. understand it. And when, so, so it's this weird kind of primal and modern mixture all the time that I think we lose. We either go all one way or all the other. Um, Laird was reading a book that's, like from it's very old and it was observations about some guy who landed in some, you know, indigenous culture. And he said from far away, you actually couldn't make, um, you couldn't tell the difference between the men and the women. The women were running very quickly and moving and they were sort of in this other thing. And of course, if she's pregnant, it's going to look different. But the point is, is that actually in old, you know, long time ago, probably women were more physical, more in movement, more on all these natural ways. And then slowly but surely the way it's impacted all of us with chairs and like sit down and be quiet. Now we do a job. We sit at a desk. It sort of puts us in those places. Not to mention that I think we naturally like it in the majority in certain ways, different things than men. Yeah. There's a yeah. sliver. There's a sliver of us that overlaps. It goes back and forth. But I think sometimes, again, it goes back to maybe girls don't want to box and roughhouse yeah. and throw yeah. rocks within four feet from each other. So yeah. I love talking to you because you do have that sharp end of the stick perspective. And I, again, I just want to remind people that we, we're, we're going to go and get granular, but that's actually not the way to be successful overall. Now, if you're mm -hmm. a powerlifting athlete or a professional athlete and you're trying to get these little bits and recover, yeah, but you're not living like that. You're working, you have a kid. It's like, you're still doing the best you can. Yep. Yep. So yeah, I don't want to end up like Wally. No, I don't think any of us do. <laughs> Which, which leads me to the, to really like my, my first question. Cause again, in getting ready for this, as I kind of go deeper into, into reading about, I don't want to call it wellness or health. Let's just call it being a human. Yeah. Cause that's what we're all trying to do. Yeah. Do you, are you at all touching on anything to do with light? You know, LED Circadian light. Mm -hmm. Huh? Are you talking about circadian rhythm or the different waves of light? No. Y yes and no. Like sort of as the, the, the deeper I go, what's really showing up overall as being something that is, we hear it all the time, like you shouldn't have blue light before you go to sleep and all these things. But the, the sort of deeper you go into these conversations, you start to realize that our LED lights, our light bulbs in our houses, our computer screens, uh, 
electricity in itself, I mean, and we're not going to get away from this stuff, is, and the fact that we're not looking at sunlight is really, it's fucking with us in a really yep. serious way. It is. This podcast has been brought to you by Bond Charge. I don't know about you, but I really enjoy just having a skincare routine. It can be just a nice, quiet time for myself. And if I'm lucky, sometimes they even turn into like a mini spa session, but without the appointment, because I use Bond Charge's red light face mask. And what this does is it uses the power of red light and it's like the ultimate skincare solution. It can help boost your collagen, kind of giving that glowing, radiant skin. It helps with the quality of your skin, even the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. And a lot of people have even been talking about it uses for blemishes and acne. I've been using it for months and I really highly recommend it. Not to mention they make it so easy. It's cordless, it's comfy. It only takes like 10 to 20 minutes a day. You can sit at your desk and do it. Listen, I want you to do all the things. I want you to be hydrated and take your supplements and get to bed and eat well. But these are these nice little perks. Oh, and another thing I've been using it of theirs is there, they have this infrared blanket. So maybe you live in an apartment or you've been curious about saunas, but you don't have room or they're expensive. I also recommend that. So bond charge has an incredible offer for you. They've activated their black Friday, cyber Monday deal for my listeners. And how it works is this is the best time to get yours or even, I know we're here already, get it as a holiday gift for family and friends and check this out. You will get 25% off if you order it today. So you can order the Bond Charge Red Light Face Mask today with this great Black Friday Cyber Monday deal for yourself, or again, as a holiday gift. All you have to do is go to bondcharge.com. And if you use my discount code, Gabby25, you will get 25% off your Red Light Face Mask and free shipping. So that's bondcharge.com, B-O-N-C-H-A-R-G-E.com. And use my exclusive promo code, Gabby, G-A-B-B-Y, 25 for your savings. So I it was is. just wondering if, if this has been showing up for you at all, uh, before we start talking about protein and exercise, there's some mm -hmm. fundamental things that I'm wondering, can we change in our environment that would also really support us in a serious way. Yeah. So Kristen Holmes, who VP with whoop and uh, she has her whole circuit and everything. She put me on to whole circadian rhythm and light stuff. So I've been digging in a little bit too. And we know that circadian rhythm is also on the cellular basis, right? So mm -hmm. when I'm talking to women and they're looking at, they're not getting light first thing and they're holding a fast and then they're going inside into a gym to do training and then they're inside all day, right? So a lot of the modernized lifestyle, but then they can't sleep. And no matter what they take, they can't sleep. And they're like, I don't understand why my sleep is so fleeting. I was like, because the basic fundamental aspect of the timing of your cells is requiring light to wake up and a phase out of light to go to sleep, plus the timing of food. So if we back it up and have you go outside first thing in the morning, just to have a couple of breaths of fresh air and stare at that sunlight, it's waking up every cellular mechanism. But if you wake up before dark, then you have to find some way before you go inside the gym to get some of that light. Otherwise you're exposed to all this nat or unnatural light, artificial light all day, the perturbations of the computer screen. And then a lot of people are TV or phones right before bed. And there's no place for your body to reset and understand that there's this light and dark phase, as well as the food timing throughout the day that actually triggers your cells to wake up and turn off and then do what they need to do while you're sleeping with this, all your reparation, your autophagy, all of that stuff that people talk about for longevity. And when I start unpacking it for women, they understand it. They're like, oh, I get it. It's not about fasting for weight loss. It's about timing my food around when my body needs it so that I can get optimal energy through the day and then wind down to get good sleep at night. And that's one of the fundamentals. And it doesn't matter what age you are. Like it's really apparent in peri and postmenopause because there's so many fleeting sleep issues, but we're seeing it earlier and earlier in their thirties and even earlier than that because of the way that we're living. So just, yeah. just trying to, again, bring us back to being human and what it means to move and see light and not be inside all day. So, yeah, I, and I the think problem it's really is, interesting. 
it's it's unbelievable. And I live with somebody who's very extreme. And so I have a tendency almost to go the other, not the other way, but you know, if Laird could have it in his druthers, every light bulb in my house would be, it'd be red. I'd be cutting in the dark, like, you know, <laughs> Yeah. And it makes me almost have a form of like teenage rebellion, which is kind of funny because I watch myself and I go, no, he's right. But somehow you're pushing against it. But yeah. I, I just wanted to to bring that up because it is something that, for example, now a hack has become, you know, go outside and stand on the grass without your shoes and ground yourself and look at the sun. And I, I want to almost bring it back into focus that that is not a hack. That no. That's, That's something you should do. Yeah. yeah. Because it, we, we, you know, everybody's listed everything and it sounds so official and it comes from a scientist. This is not a hack. This is no. something we used to do and have done forever and we've just gotten away from it. So it's a reminder. Yeah, I know. And I love how there's something that comes out and then all of a sudden it's like a social media hack and everyone's looking at the latest trend. It's like, it's not no. a late trend. Like you look no. at sauna, sauna bathing has been around forever, but now yeah. it's this hot trend, right? Hot, yeah. not pun not included, but you know what I mean? <laughs> so is the going outside and staring at the light, right? Yes. So it, yeah, it's interesting. And the other, the other thing I want to set the table on this conversation is, is that because of social media and I watch it, I try to watch it with a pretty objective eye is everybody has to get it out quick. It has to sound like it'll change your life and it'll be in three steps. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we're talking about is a practice that is just a part of your life and again, it is not about being perfect. It's about trying to hit the marks more times than not. You know, every mm -hmm. Paul check told me years ago, the 80, 20 rule, I've heard you say the 80, 20 rule. It sounds pretty good. Yeah. Um, could be like stay up one night because you're with your friends on a Saturday night. Fine. Eat some, you know, too many desserts because you went to your favorite Italian, whatever. Fine. But just these practices, because I, I want to take information like yours, which I appreciate because we are using athletes to get that, that data, those studies, all those things, but really remind people that there's no magic bullet. And like, we have to get off thinking we're going to learn it from even this podcast or Huberman or some, you know, TikToker. like right. this also has to be kind of customized to who you are, what you can do and, um, and sort of like where you live. Exactly. Yeah, I think about that a lot as well, because I have a lot of women who are like, well, obviously, because I work with a lot of women, and they're afraid to challenge themselves. And it's like, I'm not telling you to go do all of these things all week. I'm saying, let's just pick one thing, mm -hmm. let's pick one thing and just add it in. And I think people are still in that mindset of it's a quick fix, just like pharmaceuticals are a quick fix where I'm like, nope, this is a behavior that we want to implement so that you can keep it till you're 80, 90, a hundred years old. It's not a training block. It's not a, it's not a diet. These are all the things we want to start implementing for positive change so that when you are 80, 90 or hundred, you can live by yourself and carry your groceries and play checkers with your friends or whatever it is. It's not just this quick hack that everyone's being bombarded with. No. So let's, let's talk about food first, because I feel like it's the trickiest. And, and one thing you do that I really appreciate that I want to highlight is you talk about food in a way to give your brain really what it needs to then signal your body that, Hey, it's okay. Or you can start to recover or you have what you need. And I think that that is so important because a lot of times we're so obsessed with my waistline, my butt size, weight, calories, yeah. but you've, you've shifted this conversation and sort of said, yes, but the reason you want those, you know, those, those 15 grams or so of protein prior to training is so that you, your body goes, yeah, I've got some juice in the tank. I'm good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cause when we think about all of the hormone control and body composition control, everything comes from the brain. So if you're mis signaling things in the brain, nothing's going to change. Yeah. And I mean, that's part of why I try to get people to understand circadian rhythm and sleep because you're not going to get any kind of body composition change or metabolic control if you don't have good sleep. And people are like, but I can't sleep. I was like, well, that's the first thing we're working on. We have to look at circadian rhythm, light, the t like when you're eating. So we can dial that 24 hour rhythm in 
to really solidify that. And then we can start implementing change that your brain understands. It's not about how you're fueling the periphery. It's not about how you're fueling your muscles or trying to tap into that extra body fat. It's about what is your brain saying <laughs> to give you the energy to go hard when you want to go hard. And a lot of people are like, oh, but you know, I want to train every day. And I was like, well, if you can train every day at the same intensity, then you're not training hard enough. Right. And right. when you start trying to really get people from couch potatoes all the way up to some of the lead athletes who understand rest and recovery, and then they start to get it. They're like, oh, if I eat well and I push myself really hard on one day, then these other days I can recover and my body's going to actually adapt. I mean, to get to where I want to be. Yeah. I think this is a really important point. I, I've gone back and forth with like on the days I know that the best thing I could do is stretch and go in a sauna and do some sort of active recovery versus like mark, you know, torture myself, kill myself. Yeah. Um, I've had to really psychologically get a relationship with understanding. I've shifted my thinking like, no, now your muscles are getting stronger as well. So that when you go back to work, uh, things are going to work better and you won't get broken down and, and things like that. So I yeah. just, I really appreciated that because imagine if we could start thinking about when we eat and be like, Oh, what is my brain going to, how is it going to respond to this? Um, because that's a, that's a much more, that's a meaningful conversation than just, you know, calories in and calories out, but really yeah. sort of going, Oh, the, the driver here is going to get this signal. So, so prior to workout, you know, a lot of people say, some people say I have to eat. Some people don't want to eat. And you're like, listen, do it any way that you want, but you need a few things prior to exercise. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, cause people exercise whatever time of day they can fit it in for the most part. Right. So if you're waking up at five o'clock and you are like, I got to get my session in, in my garage gym at five 30, you're not going to really think, oh, I'm going to eat because you're still not hungry. You're waking up. And that's where something liquid comes in. Right. But if you're someone who's like you get up and you have all the family obligations and then you got to get to work and you got to focus at work and then you have a lunchtime workout, then you have the opportunity to eat and fuel. But a lot of times people will eat like at 10 or 11 and then their lunchtime work gets at 1230. You still want to put something in so they can get through all of that after having the stress of the morning to be able to hit those intensities and things that you want to do. So it's like really trying to unpack that and say, it's not about, like you said, calories in calories out. It's about the stress, your body understanding what exercise stress is, that the stress occurs during exercise, but all the recovery and adaptation occurs outside of exercise. So what are, what are we doing to support it? How are we supporting the brain to understand that so we can get the feedback mechanisms to really build the muscle, lose that visceral fat and all the things that we're looking for for longevity? And typically, and again, if we had the opportunity to take someone's blood and, and monitor them and do all these things, we could get even more exact. But let's say we're, we're talking about some universal rules, at least for women, because I know men have a much longer window after training that they yeah. can get away with before they, you know, put some protein in the body and, and some other um, kind of nutrition to recover. Our window is about an hour, right? Or so. Yeah. Yeah. So let's say prior to, cause like for me, for example, I'll give people an example. I train most days at 8.30 AM and it used to be a, a little bit later when I had to take my kids to school, but it's, it's around there, 8.30. So let's say 8.30 or nine. I don't want to eat a big meal. So I drink coffee, but I load it. I put, I actually put a protein creamer in there. I put a coconut oil as well. So I put a fat and that kind of rides me, me personally. Some people might do it in a smoothie. I think um, I've heard you say that maybe you might do a little protein powder. I do or... a protein loaded coffee too. You do? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so, and, and for other people, let's say they want to eat real food. Is it a boiled egg and some avocado? Like, what is that? And what are, yeah, we, so what, what are they be looking for? What are they looking for? So we typically say 15 grams of protein. That could be two eggs. It could be, uh, you know, a third a cup of chia oat pudding with some Greek yogurt on it. Um, it could even be sprouted grain bread with some avocado. It's not a lot. We look at maybe 150 to 200 calories if you're cal counting calories. And it's enough that you're not stuffed. 
you are like, yeah, okay, I've taken the edge off my hunger, but my brain is going, yep, sweet, ready to go. Mm. What's the relationship with cortisol in that? Because our cortisol sort of, is it peak kind of within the first 30 minutes of when we wake up no matter what, or is it still connected to the sun and circadian rhythm? How does that work in relationship to food? Yeah. So if we wake up naturally without an alarm clock, then we know for sure that cortisol is definitely on that peak within a half an hour. Mm -hmm. If we're using an alarm clock, that peak is higher because it's a stress of waking up to the alarm and it does occur within that half an hour. So if we're thinking about peaks of cortisol, our natural wave isn't as, as fluctuating as when we have these stressors, because that's what cortisol is. It's a response to stress. So it's really important that if you use an alarm clock to get up, that you have something within that half an hour to dampen that peak. Because if we're holding that, that cortisol wave, we're staying in that breakdown state and our body's like, okay, we're using lean mass because it's an active tissue. So if we're in, in the mode of trying to build our muscle and keep our bone, then we have to be really cognate of that cortisol peak in the morning. And then throughout the day, this is the other thing I explained. It's like, okay, w cortisol has to come up and come down. It's a natural thing. We're not trying to flatline it because it's a normal hormone that's responsible for how we respond during the day. So yes, you'll have these peaks and troughs throughout the day. That's normal when you're responding to things like the phone ringing or all of a sudden a sudden stop at the, you know, the stoplight, like those are normal things. But what we don't want is we don't want this big, huge surge because of that response. So if you're eating on a regular basis throughout the day, you're able to dampen that peak because food is really important. And then you have that lull in the afternoon as your body's starting to wind down to get ready for all the reparation that occurs while you're sleeping. So that's why like you talk about food and light, you're layering that on with how the body's responding to stress during the day. Do you separate your, to the best of your ability, because, you know, for example, if I have the opportunity to have a little bit of a later dinner to celebrate with my whole family, I'll take that all day long because that yeah. connection is important. But it, it, in an ideal world, I'm sort of trying to, I end up going to bed about three hours after I eat ish. And then, you know, you start feeling like you're doing the, like the early bird special. I and it's ridiculous, right? <laughs> but it, do you, do you sort of instruct people like, hey, keep this window X of when you try to consume your dinner most times and when you go to bed. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, if you're going out with friends and you're sitting around the table at a restaurant, you're not going to be tapping on your watch going to eight, six 30. I go to bed at 10 30. I go to bed at nine 30. Come on. We got to eat. <laughs> Nobody likes, listen, I have friends that are so dedicated and great at this. I don't invite them to my house because it's too stressful. Yeah. Yeah. You got to roll with it. I mean, because socialization is so important. If you're by yourself all the time in the silo, we see ex exceedingly high amounts of depression and anxiety. And we're trying to dampen that. You need that social connection. You need nature. You need all of the things that makes us human, right? So if you're going out with your friends, you don't want to add the stress of, okay, what time is it? Let's go. Yeah. So, so about three-ish hours whenever you can yeah. kind of do it. Yeah. Do you, you know, I was, I recently posted something cause I weigh right now about 180 pounds and I feel more comfortable at like 172, 175. Like I know my body is an athlete, just the way I move around and stuff. It just feels kind of just a little better. I, I don't feel like I sacrifice power and I just feel a little lighter is better, but someone wrote me a note and said, Oh, it's your menopause. And I, and I said, probably two pounds of it is, but I, I, you know how it's been a kind of a, the world I feel like is a little more stressful. Like it feels yes. emotional and more stressful. I feel we're combative. And even though I, I try to separate from it, I, I think I'm like everyone, we're all antennas for it. Yeah. And I actually think that the other sort of five pounds is sort of, is this kind of eating of the vibration of all the craziness yes. of the world uh, and the, sh and the stress. So I, I only bring that up because sometimes when you're more in touch with things, you, you kind of, I think you can separate them. Like I'm not just buying, I'll be 55 in January that, Oh, it's the menopause. Like that's overall pretty dialed. I'll get into that later. It's also realizing 
my stress, my level of internal happiness or sense of peace, that impacts my physical health in, in this abstract, invisible way that I don't know if people can always parse that out. Yeah, I don't think they realize that. And I don't think they realize that like right now in the States with all the election stuff that's going on, how stressful it is. Like even being an expat and you're seeing the news and I'm like, I can't watch that. It makes me so stressed. <laughs> and it's just that subconscious stress. It's just bringing it up on everyone. And we don't have the empathy. We don't have the ability to really get into that parasympathetic response of relaxation. And all of that increases inflammation. It increases a little bit of metabolic disturbance and of course, stress is stress. It's that sympathetic drive. And when you're in that sympathetic drive, your body's like, ah, oh, well, we got to go. I've got to have fuel. So we see yeah. like that stress that comes on. And when we're able to, like, there are a few places here in New Zealand where there's no cell phone or internet. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, yeah. I'm going to go there and I'm going to be completely unplugged. And it's really interesting the first day of like detoxing away from all that stress. And then all of a sudden you get into this rhythm where you're like, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize how stressed I was. Yeah. And I, and I, I think it's important because women talk to each other, but if you're in groups where everyone's sort of experiencing the same thing, there, there's generally not an outside perspective to go, Hey, there's, there's some variables going on here that would impact anyone. And, and I, th I think we live in a world that is heightened because we're supposed to live in s small populations. We're not supposed to see every bad, you know, news yeah. from yeah. all around the entire world. We're not, we're not set up for it just because we're doing it. And, um, and I, I don't know that we've honored that as something that impacts our, our health. And because women overall, I, I think are more sensitive. I think we feel it in a, in a deeper way. Um, so, Okay, so 15 grams of protein before, and then you're pretty, you're pretty definitive about, hey, listen, you've got about 30 minutes to 60 minutes after you train to give your brain slash body really what it needs and what it's looking for. And so what's, what's some of the kind of some of the better numbers that people can aim for? So we look at see if you are before perimenopause, then we're looking at 35 grams. If you're perimenopause all the way through postmenopause, we're looking at 40 grams. So it's a big whack of protein. Yeah. And I mean, you can split it up, right? So you could have, you could dose it. So mm -hmm. half an hour and then another dose at the top of the hour or something like that. Does it but buy you time? The, if you dose it, it like if you get you it in, in that first 30 minutes, does it, does it buy you glide time at all? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Absolutely. And the, again, the whole goal is to stop that breakdown effect because mm -hmm. we see that people who hold uh, food until they're hungry. So they might train at like nine and then they're like, oh, well, lunchtime is 1130 or 12. And so they hold that. And during that time period, we see in the research that the brain is like, I'm in this breakdown state. I can't recover. I can't repair. So I'm just going to keep on ticking over, breaking down that lean mass. So even though I'm in a supposed resting state, I still need to like try to keep going. So I'm going to break down this active tissue. So it is breaking down that lean mass. So when people are like, oh, I went to the gym, I did fasted training, then I got so busy and I didn't eat until noon. Then I'm like, well, why did you go to the gym? Because you just went and hammered yourself for no reason because you don't have the availability for the brain to understand that, okay, this was a good stress and we need to recover from it quickly. Mm -hmm. So it is that parsing out. Like if you're doing 15 grams first thing and then it's an hour strength session, that does buy you time, right? So we're seeing that, okay, you have your 15 grams, it's a strength session, and then you have another 20, 25 afterwards, then it buys you that time to, you know, another hour or so, and then you can have your real meal. Yeah. You can split your breakfast. It doesn't have to be something that's, that that's extra because people are like, Oh, I'm too full to eat all of that. Or I'm not hungry because I had a hard session. So it's just being cognitive of what you have to have in a day. Like what is your protein needs in a day? And then you can split it up. Yeah. I there was that study that came out that's saying you could have a big whack of a hundred grams, but that was done on men. And there's no way we can say, yeah, that's adequate for women. It's like, yeah, there's no top end in this area of men, but I'm still saying that for women, we really need to look at the research that's been done. And we see that parsing protein up throughout the day is really super beneficial. 
Yeah. With men, they have almost, let's say like a three hour window to, to get yeah. some of the, those nutritional needs. Yeah. Yeah. And it has to do with blood glucose and how your body responds. So, I mean, we see metabolism differences during exercise where men will go through liver and muscle glycogen. Women will go through blood glucose first and then start tapping into fatty acids and, and our, our amino acid stores. So the slight variations in metabolism that we see that occur between men and women really do dictate how we recover. So when we see a lot of the rhetoric that's around in social media about how there's no recovery window, they're just glomming it from the male data and the male metabolism. What year would, did we start doing studies on women? Adequately. <laughs> well, okay. That's fair. Uh, no, not the performance studies. Let's just say you know, study, it was a sort of illegal, right? Until like 93 or I don't know what it was. Well, it wasn't 93? illegal per se, but just, yeah, there were a lot of loopholes. And then finally, I think in the seventies when they were doing the thalamide studies and we mm -hmm. started seeing all the birth defects, that's when they put the kibosh on studying women, especially pregnant women. Mm -hmm. And then NIH started looking at the data that was coming out, things like bone density research and cardiovascular research, all that was being done on men who were being supplied with estrogen. It's like, that is not adequate. And it's like, <laughs> that is not how we look at women. Even mouse studies were all done on male rats, right? Mm -hmm. And so in the nineties, the NIH put a mandate out saying, we have to include women. And if you don't, you have to have a really good reason why not to. People still found loopholes. And it wasn't until the two thousands where people were like, nope, you cannot have these loopholes. We have to look. And I think that that's a really important thing because going back to trends, fasting, I guess about eight years ago, started really trending hardcore. And you were sort of, and you were definitely one of the first people I ever heard like, hey, listen, especially performance women perform better f fed, not fasted. Yeah. And, yeah. and really, premenopause, menopausal women definitely have to be mindful of fasting. So maybe we could just put, some bumpers around if you are, you know, 20 to 40, what does that look like? And then maybe women who are moving into menopause, what we, you know, eating windows versus fasting and kind of what's the best way to approach that most times? Yeah. So it doesn't really matter how old you are. I tell people, look, if we want to use the buzzwords, then we use time restricted eating and right. time restricted eating, right? Is after a half an hour after you wake up, you have breakfast, you eat through the day, and then you have dinner and you don't have food two to three hours before bed. And then you're, you have about that 12 hour. If you're a cancer patient, we know that 13 or 14 hours overnight fast is a lot better. And if you are someone who is sedentary, obese, and really needing to lose weight, then maybe we look at holding a fast, but it's from the afternoon overnight to the morning. Because we see that people who break their fast first thing in the morning and then start their fast in the afternoon have all the outcomes of what the literature says with regards to autophagy, improved telomere length, better blood glucose control, all of the things that we're looking for. But there's this constant battle because people think that if they hold their fast till noon or after, because it's easier to skip breakfast because hunger is muted until you eat that that's beneficial. But we mm -hmm. see, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman, it's really detrimental. Because again, it messes with your circadian rhythm and your body's in a little bit of a like, what's going on, I'm stressed out. So we see more um, missteps in insulin control. We see more visceral fat being up, um, accumulated in both men and women. So if we're looking at what's ideal, it's eat for the task at hand. So if you get up to an alarm, you know that that's hot, that higher stress, you got to have some protein, a little bit of carbohydrate, really to dampen that stress. And if you go into training, knowing that training is another stress that you're putting on your body, and it's a, it's a positive stress because you're trying to implement positive change, but your body requires fuel in order to accommodate for that stress. And because it was such a strong stress, you have to have some fuel afterwards so that it can understand what that stress was recover and come back down to a new baseline. So it's the accumulation of who are you and what is your stress in the day? And we have to eat to accommodate for that stress. 
And when we get to perimenopause and into postmenopause, because we are sympathetically driven, because our body's under such severe changes, if we're thinking about how all of our sex hormones are starting to change and every system in the body is affected, we have to be really dialed in to accommodating for that stress and applying certain foods across the board to help with our gut microbiome, to help with amino acid circulation, to help with neurotransmitters. And it sounds really complex, but it comes back down to eating regular intervals of really good, wholesome foods throughout the day. So it's not that difficult, but people try to make it really difficult. You, you mentioned something that just reminded me about the diversity of the microbiome, especially when you're older. Mm -hmm. um, that is there parts of it, I don't want to say they get kind of more locked in, but the importance of keeping that diversity, how it's even more important as you're older? Yeah, because we see that about four or five years before that one point in time menopause, this is where a lot of women experience significant body composition change. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that there's a definitive link to gut microbiome because when we're looking at our sex differences, there's a second pass. So that means that their sex hormones go to the liver and the liver binds it up. It gets shot into the gut via bile. And then we have gut bugs that unpack it and shoot those sex hormones back out. But when we start losing those sex hormones, we start losing that second pass aspect. So we lose those gut bugs. And unfortunately, we're also sympathetically driven, which means we're under a lot of stress. And when we're under a lot of stress, the bacteria that grows in response to that is the bacteria that makes us crave simple carbohydrates because the body's under stress. It's like, we need glucose. So you start getting into this really bad episodic of I'm craving simple carbs. I eat simple carbs. It grows that bacteria. Plus we know that we're going through more protein. We need more protein, but we're not necessarily accommodating for that because we have this craving for carbohydrate. So if we bring it back down and I do kind of like the British idea of 30 plants, you know, a week, try to get, because then that really encourages that variation in our gut microbiome. So if we can focus on not necessarily the scientific stuff that I just explained, but getting all a whole variety of different plants in that helps with all that scientific stuff I just explained. <laughs> can you, and, and people don't realize like spices that falls into that, yeah. that under that umbrella. Cause when people hear 30, it's like, Yes. And that includes all your spices and the, and the other little things Parsley. you do. Right. To flavor your yeah. food. Like, yeah. like you said, don't make it so scientific. Do you have a, a thing you do where you go, Hey, I don't have time. I, I'm, I'm on the go. I'm, uh, is there, is there a trick or a food that you use before or after training when you know that like, you're not going to be able to put it together. So you just sort of have this, you know, for me, it, it, it is boiled eggs. Like I just go, Hey, mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's, there's fat, there's other things, there's protein, there's some good stuff in there for me. I do feel satisfied. Um, yeah. Is there, is there something like that, that you use as a tool? Yeah. Um, every night I make sure that I have chia oatmeal and um, raisins with some vanilla all mixed in with some almond milk. And then I'll scoop that and I'll put that with some protein powder. And then I'm like, okay, yeah, good to go. It's in there. And that's the way it's going to go. Yep. I like that. I've been lately, cause I have been trying to be more diligent. I've been using yogurt and it sounds weird and using uh whey protein and just mm -hmm. kind of mixing it and eating it. And yeah. it, it works really well. Cause I don't want to go through, I, again, this is just being really honest. I don't want to make a blender, do with the whole thing, clean the blender, put the thing, get, I don't want, and I don't want to sit there and drink it. Or, like, it's like, I just want to get it in there and go. So I think when you mess around with it, there's just a lot of, a lot of ways to, to get yeah. around with it. Um, and the other thing is if you don't want to use protein powder, you can mix cottage cheese and yogurt. Yeah. There you go. And people are like, Ooh, gross cottage cheese. But I have a friend who's like, oh, I hate the texture of cottage cheese, but she'll mix it in with yogurt and then it acquires the consistency of yogurt. And then yeah. she's getting this massive 40 grams of protein without having to do much except open two containers. I was like, that's yeah. brilliant. I actually use high quality bread, like a risen bread and put mm -hmm. um, cottage cheese on top of it. Cause then you say so you have yeah. the dry and the kind of wet and it's actually weirdly good. Good. Yeah. Put some tahini on top and then it's magic. Wow, you're getting fancy now. I like it. Mm. Um, yeah. I want to remind people too, cortisol not only is a great thing, but in the morning they always say, especially stressful things, exercise, 
got to fire somebody, have an uncomfortable conversation. I think especially for us as women, where maybe sometimes generating that kind of energy is a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, that high cortisol is really your best friend. Yep. You know, you can it ask is. for what you want. You can like work hard. There's all, sort of all these great things uh, to utilize in that early morning uh, that really benefits us. So I, I just want to remind people of that, like to use that time as a window of getting the uncomfortable things done, whatever they are. Yes, yes, exactly. And then you have the rest of the day to recover from it. Yeah, you can be all nice and, you know, yeah, kind to everybody after. Just <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, more, more kind. Yes. Yeah. So alcohol, you know, obviously, and nobody likes to hear it. And, and you hear sort of like, hey, it takes the edge off. So, you, you know, people go, well, stress or take the edge off, like which one? But overall, does anything show up different as you get older with alcohol, how it can impact you or a performance, a performing athlete? Has anyone, has anything really shown up for you? Like, oh, we notice X, Y, or Z. Yeah, it's one of the first things I tell people to cut out when they're trying to get rid of a cereal fat and inflammation because it is, you know, it's one of those things that we gravitate towards when it just becomes a habit. Mm -hmm. It's fine in moderation. We know that, you know, so if you have a big celebration, that's sweet. I'm notorious for loving a good whiskey, so I'm not going to pass that up, right? Because, but I'm not going to have whiskey every day. Right. And I live in a culture where, unfortunately, it's a heavy drinking culture where, you know, there's a kid's birthday party at 10 o'clock on a Sunday and people are passing around glasses of wine. I'm like, wait, no, we need to cut that back. We look at performance. Yeah, there's a detriment when we're talking about performance because it is a preferential fuel that gets used instead of carbohydrate and fat. Mm -hmm. um, and we also see it invokes a little bit of dehydration. So if we're talking about like really trying to be in our A game, you want to rethink what you're drinking. Again, you can have it in moderation, but when we look overall, if you're consistently having it, it is a, a, a contributor to visceral fat. It's a contributor to dehydration. It's a contributor to a misstep in our exercise fueling as well as our daily fueling because alcohol is deemed a quote poison to the liver. So your body's trying to cull through it. So if you've ever noticed someone who's had a big drinking night and goes for a run and they smell like they're sweating alcohol, it's because they are. So it is, it is something that's a little bit like, just be aware right? Don't yeah. make it the mainstay. Don't come home and say, I'm having my glass of wine while making dinner because that's something that it's a habit. So just kind of back it down and maybe you do it twice or three times a week instead of every day. Yeah. And, and I like the way you said it, make it celebratory, something that you yeah. use as a celebration tool. Um, you know, not just on the days that end with why, uh, no, and that's yes. for men and for women. Like we're going to be exactly. saying things that are specific, but again, I, I joke that I've done so many talks and stuff and people are, they're leaning in. I can see they're like favorable. And then people will ask me like, Hey, do you drink? And, and I'm like, no. And you, you can just see, you know, <laughs> people, I know I'm they're the same like, way. Are <laughs> oh, you're too healthy. Cause you don't drink. It's like, actually, yeah. mm, no. I didn't start drinking after I had my kid because it made me way too tired and I can't handle a hangover because I'm already tired enough. Yeah. And yeah. then I've just gotten out of the habit. And like I said, I like a good whiskey, but don't put a whole fleet in front of me because I'm not going to be able to drink it. <laughs> right. Do you, is this true that men metabolize things like 25, 30% sort of quicker than women? I've heard that. And I was just wondering if that's something you've heard as well. Yeah, women have a slower gastric emptying rate and a slower gut transit time. Mm -hmm. So our digestion is slower. So yes, we metabolize things slower. And that's why you see like men can have more to drink because it gets through the system a lot faster. Also has to do with what we call the SIP gene, which is their drug and alcohol metabolism gene. And we see that it's more upregulated in most men than it is in women, which is why we see issues with things like Ambien and some of the other drugs that are pushed out as well as alcohol. So it is, yeah, it's definitely a sex difference that isn't talked about a lot. Yeah. No. And I, I just, I read that years ago and I thought, I wonder if, if that's really true. Um, I can, yeah. I, and I just see it with Laird and I in certain things where I think I, but again, I'm not using him as a comparison or me. So I was just curious if that's something that you had heard. Yeah. You, you mentioned sleep a lot and, um, 
you you've shared, I mean, obviously we t- sleep hygiene. I think everyone knows like get to bed around the same time, blue mm-hmm. lights before you go to bed. You, you know, I, I don't think you want to do like a ton of stressful things before you go to bed, try to, you know, downregulate things like this, but you also will use certain supplementation, especially when you're traveling to kind mm-hmm. of help ease you into that. Um, so maybe you could, you can share how you learned about it and, and kind of what's, what is it doing? Yeah. So when I was doing my postdoc at Stanford, I had the opportunity to work with one of the top complementary alternative medicine scientists that came over to do a sabbatical from Columbia. And she was looking at things like black cohosh and ashwagandha and rhodiola, especially in menopausal women trying to see, hey, can we attenuate hot flashes? Can we reduce stress? So it was the first time where I had been introduced to things like adaptogens and plant compounds. And I was at that time really interested in naturopath and understanding how herbs and things can affect the system. So I got right into the adaptogens. And she's like, yep, there's really good um, randomized controlled trials. There's all this information. So then I was like, oh, yeah. Okay, let's get out of the woo-woo-ness of a lot of the naturopathy stuff. I probably get slammed for saying that, but being in that scientific world, I'm like, okay, I really want to look at it. So I started looking at ashwagandha, shashandra, rhodiola, how that affects cortisol, how uh, things like rhodiola can um, act as a serum. So that's a, a an estrogen modulator and how that affects estrogen metabolism. Um, especially in, in peri and postmenopausal women and how ashwagandha can affect thyroid as well as our cortisol. So really looking at all these different nuances. So then traveling as a bike racer and having the stress of racing on the circuit as well as the jet lag issues and the transmeridian travel issues, it's like, okay, well, I want to really get recovery as much as I can. So I started using them. Then when I started traveling more for work, with regards to bike racing and going over Tour de France and all that kind of stuff, really started using it for jet lag. So now it just became a thing that I would use. And then I started talking about adaptogens for perimenopausal women and how all these things can work instead of you know trying to go down the pharmaceutical route. And then people are like, hey, what do you do for sleep? I'm like, well, L-theanine, because it really does invoke more alpha, alpha wave activity, parasympathetic activity really helps calm you down. Mm -hmm. And for me, rhodiola is a a calming agent. It's not a a wake up stressful agent. So I use that as well. And then um, to top it off, I'll use epigenin, which people use when they drink chamomile tea, right? But I'm like, okay, it's easy to travel with. So I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is a natural substance. So your body is like, okay, I understand it. It's not a pharmaceutical. So you don't have the residual hangovers of any of it. And it's like my daughter in puberty with all of her wackiness. She's like, could I, can I have some sleepies mom? So I'll give her an L-theanine and it just calms her down so she can get sleep too. It's just little things that you're like, okay, how am I going to really invoke that parasympathetic? How am I going to help? And people are like, but what are you doing? Those are herbs. I was like, but you're more than willing to take an ibuprofen. So we have really good randomized control trial on this stuff. And we have probably less on ibuprofen. So I'm going to use it. It's just that pharmaceutical mentality that a lot of people have. I think it's, it's sort of like the news here. I don't know how the conditioning starts, but we are so much quicker. Well, the the guy or the girl in the white coat gave it to me, so I'll take it. But this thing that grows from the ground over here, I'm kind of wary of, or I don't I know. know. I, I always want to invite people because I, I think it isn't about you know, it's not about criticizing, like, how did we get here that you would believe, uh, you know, a produced TV show that's giving that it's telling you the truth. And the same with your doctor, even though that they're well intended. um, I think we're at a time where there's a real opportunity to peel out and to really get with ourselves and ask, Mm -hmm. like, well, how does this feel for us? But the mentality feels like everybody just wants to check it off the box. Like, okay, I've answered that. Like I took the pill bang or I've done this so I don't have to deal with it. But I think everything like your work, for example, is about a hundred percent dealing with it yourself. Yeah. I'm about empowering people to understand their bodies. And then what can we use that's around us 
from different stressors because I'm initially an environmental exercise physiologist. So that means I look at all the environmental cues to apply stress and adapt to it so that we can get stronger. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we need to be stress resilient. So when we look at all the things that I'm telling people to do, it's about becoming more stress resilient. And sometimes we need a little help coming back down from some of the stress that we put on. So then we look at plants. If we look at seaweed, right? We see there's a variation in the amount of protein that's in seaweed because it's very adaptable. If it's in the dark, dark waters with no sunlight, it has a higher protein content because it has to, to adapt to survive. And when we see seaweed that's closer up to the surface, then has less of the protein, but more of the chlorophyll because it's trying to grab that sunlight and survive that way. So it's very adaptable. So if we're looking at, you know, we have all these adaptable things in the environment. The human being is in that environment. It's very adaptable. So let's apply appropriate stressors and then also kind of support that stress without having to look at, I need a crutch from pharmaceuticals. There's definitely a time and a place. Don't get me wrong. But I think that in our environment, we've become so reliant on the pill and the mentality that more is better when actually if we dial it right back, we can find least the least dose that's the most effective. And I really see people have a hard time grasping that concept. Yeah, it's, it, it is very interesting. I think that's where you almost feel like the more you're, I hate to say it, like a lot of times if people go through the system and they're well-educated and they're sort of naturally more compliant, it's harder to get them to pull out of that and just making yeah. the invitation for them to mess around, try it out, see how it feels. Yeah. Um, would those sleeping uh, supplements also support men? Yeah, absolutely. Great. So training, you, you're, you obviously, you come from being an athlete, so it's a little different and you, you study again, performance women. So a lot of times, uh, the convert it's, it kind of blows my mind because people are, women are still, you know, cardioing themselves to death even now. And I think yoga is great. There's a place for it. It's not the, it's nothing is the answer to exercise, but it's like, you sort of see them leaning into these these same categories of training. And you've been mm -hmm. saying for years, like, Hey, lean muscle mass is your very dear friend. Um, yeah. not only for aesthetics, but for certainly longevity and cognitive function and all these things. So let's not start from the athletic woman's point of view. Let's just take from a householder's point of view. She isn't in menopause yet. She's 20 to 30, 20 to 40. She's in the working world. There's a reality. Yeah. What is it, what is, what would be kind of, what would her week in an, in a perfect world, what would she, what buckets would she be trying to hit? I think the big rock for everyone is against strength training, but when we're looking at resistance training, when you're younger, you can mess around more, you know, how you're saying, Hey, give yourself permission to play around. Yeah. So if you want to do a traditional, like periodized overload, then yeah, go for it. But if you're someone who's like, Mm, I don't have a lot of time. Maybe I'm just going to work on strength. Go for that too. Like work on the lower power rep range, play around with French contrast or, or um, contrast training where you're doing heavy lifts right into plyometric work to improve power. Um, it's short. It's very intense. It works really well. But as you get older, that's when you really have to focus on the, that kind of training. When you're in your twenties and forties, you can pepper it up, right? And you can do a lot of resistance training and then pepper it up with some endurance stuff, do some high intensity work because you can recover really well. Your body's really resilient. But as you start getting older and you're starting to see changes and your body's not responding, that's when you have to dial it in. We're like, OK, what kind of external stress are we going to apply so the body understands I need to adapt without any kind of hormone help? So that's when we start looking at, you know, if someone has premature ovarian failure in their 30s and they're like, what the hell, what's happened? Then it's like, OK, well, now we have to treat the body like you were postmenopausal. So we have to look at how are we going to build that lean mass? We have neural adaptations. We need that strong stress of lifting heavy. We need some plyometrics, some power based stuff to get that neural adaptation for more power. So there are nuances as you get older that you have to pay attention to, but your twenties and 40 through forties, good time to play. Try everything, see what works for you. Yeah, it's so true. I, I think that that's the, uh, people will say, well, what do you think, you know, for me come, you know, I'm at the age of, I still have my cycle, but I'm obviously in the age zone of, you know, yep perimenopause, menopause. And I said, listen, the gift of having messed around for 30 years prior to, you know, coming into this has, has really been a, a great uh, tool. 
but it also makes the transition easier, right? You're coming in with kind of armed with some things. So if somebody's listening to this and they go, listen, great for you guys, but I, I got a real job and I work eight to 10 hours a day. And then I had, I was dealing with my family and then we're saying you got to sprint. They're like, okay, well, how the hell do you do that? Like, yeah, how would you yeah. start somebody who maybe has never sprinted and, and maybe they hear the word sprint, but they don't know what that means. Yeah. So um, I like to preface this with, I work with a couple of um, breakfast TV hosts who have to get up at, oh my God, it's super early. <laughs> Three o'clock, and, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Super early, but they have family <laughs> and they have kids. Mm -hmm. So they want to have dinner with their kids and stuff. And then they also want to work out. Um, wake up and I, there's a 10 minute circuit that they do where they do three to five minutes of mobility. And then they do some 30 second explosive kettlebell swings as their sprint. And then they do some stretching, getting the shower and go. And so when we're looking at what does it take, it can be 10 minutes and that's really effective. Wakes them up, then they're ready to go. And then they'll do some more focused, heavy lifting resistance training a few afternoons when they're like the kids are at, at rugby because we're in New Zealand <laughs> right? or, or soccer. And so they have 45 minutes. So they'll be in their the gym at work or gym at home and they're focusing on some really proper lifting and they'll do the sprint stuff, you know, a few times a week and the, and the days that they're not doing the sprint stuff, they'll spend more time with more of the mindfulness, breathing, parasympathetic to then be able to get through the day. So it's really effective when we're looking at time management of what does sprinting mean? It doesn't mean running sprints. It means the intensity where 30 seconds or less as hard as you can go. And it takes some time to learn how to do that because a lot of women have not been pushed that hard. So I'm always like, okay, well, if we want to learn how to do this, let's get an assault bike and two of your friends. And we're going to put you on a assault bike and your friends are going to be cheering you on. You're going to go as hard as you can for 30 seconds and read how many meters you got. Now, mm -hmm. while your other two friends are going as hard as they can, you're recovering. So you end up with like three or so minutes recovery in between, maybe a little bit longer, you get back on that assault bike and you try to beat those meters. And because you have the reinforcement of your friends and you don't want to fail in front of your friends, you really push yourself and you see what that means. And people are afraid of pushing themselves that hard. So they're like, okay, well, let's start with some explosive kettlebell swings where you're not going overhead. You're just really using the hip hinge to push forwards. So you're going as hard as you can. And that's driving the heart rate up. It's getting the idea of what that means to get that really super high intensity, but it's not biomechanically as taxing. So there's different ways that we can teach this and it doesn't take a lot. So if we're looking at someone who's really time pressed for work, it's like if you have 20 or 30 minutes first thing in the morning, then we're going to do some mobility. We're going to do some little explosive movements and then you're going to jump in the shower, have your protein drink maybe on the shower ledge and then you get in the car or, or get to the train, you get to work. And then if you're going through work and you're like, oh, I have a little bit of extra time or my friend's going to the gym and she's my lifting partner, then you go and you do that. But it's how are we, you know, really dialing it in for what you're doing? Yeah. And I think here, especially, you know, we package everything and gets labeled, but you, you're like hit training isn't necessarily hit training. Like right. the way you view hit training and the way you define a high intensity workout is different than sometimes what people are actually participating in. Yeah. And it's frustrating <laughs> because I mean, you have all these programs and stuff that are said to be high intensity interval training and women feel completely worked when they finish it. But I don't think the message out there is you don't have to feel that way after every workout. Yeah. If we're doing a proper high intensity interval session, um, then if we're looking at, at intervals that are one to three minutes, then you have variable recovery, but you're not going to be doing that for 45 minutes. Right. Your work time, total work time with recovery time might be 25 minutes because you are looking at maintaining a, a specific intensity at that interval. And once that intensity drops off and you're in moderate intensity, you're no longer applying the right stress to your body. Now you're just slogging it out and creating more sympathetic drive and more catabolic recovery states. And we don't want that. So I am always like, okay, if we want to look at high intensity interval training versus sprint interval training, high intensity interval training is around eight on a scale of one to or 10 sprint interval training is 11. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And when we're looking at those intervals that you're doing on an eight, it might be every minute on the minute, you're doing something one minute and you might have 20 seconds to transfer to the next ex exercise for the next minute. And you do four minutes on, one minute off, and you do two or three rounds of that and call it. Yeah. And that's the right kind of intensity. Yeah. And it doesn't take an hour. It doesn't take an hour and a half. You go to the gym. I don't want you to spend 90 minutes lifting. That's just too long. It's like you want to get in and get out and be very effective with what you're doing. And when people start understanding, they don't need to do a total body set that takes 90 minutes every time they go to the gym. You can focus just on squats. It might be five by five on the two minute, five reps, rest the rest of the two minutes, do another five reps, rest the rest of the two minutes, in and out, gone. Yeah. I love that, uh, that clarification because people don't realize it's priming the pump. If you've been sedentary or, you know, understandably caught up in life and sort of ha haven't been at it or never been at it, that mm -hmm. beginning part, getting that lever going is so hard. But once you have it going, um, you're, you're sort of off to the races if you can just be really consistent with your sleep, your food, your stress management, and your exercising your, and that yeah. strategy. Yeah. I, re I really appreciate that. So, you, one thing I, I loved is the physics of the body versus the biology. Yeah. This, this is something I thought was a really, just a really interesting, just a differentiating point. Cause I, I don't think people really think about that. No, because they put it all in the same category. Yeah. So I'm, you know, and I'm sure you're at the same or similar age. So it's like all the soft tissue injuries and the joint issues that we hear from our friends yeah. where like we've kind of been accustomed to that through our sporting histories, right? <laughs> so when someone starts experiencing soft tissue injuries or joint pain, it's all new to them. They're like, well, I can't jump. I can't sprint. It hurts. It's like, okay, well, let's look at what we can do mm -hmm. to invoke that physiological stress without hurting the joints. Let's, let's look what we can do to improve the strength around that joint so you don't get these soft tissue injuries. So separating out the biomechanical from the physiological dose that we want and really getting people to understand that, yes, you can work around these parameters and then we can get you stronger to prevent these injuries and to help with that joint pain. And that's another buy-in. People are like, what? Okay, I want to move better and I don't want this pain. What do I do to do that? Yeah. And the time I suffer the most is when I am not moving the time. Yeah, same. I, but I will say this, I don't, there's not a day that I train that I don't feel something, something is hurting a little. We were somewhere and somebody said to Laird, Oh, you're limping. And Laird's like, I'm limping. I've been limping since I was 16. Like, <laughs> I think people don't realize or they go like, Oh, I feel a little hurt. Now I always tell my friends, if they're training with me, I go hurt and hard are different. And, and, and sometimes oh, the other part of this is the education. So if something sort of, you kind of go, Oh, something hurts. It's like, yeah, well, what's off and what else is happening upstream or downstream of that, that forces you to have to take a look at it. So the other thing people don't get the relationship with that maybe athletes do earlier is what is this telling me? What do I need yeah. to change? And so I, I really, you know, that point is, is really incredible Someone might be listening to this and go, well, that's easy for you to say you're, you know, you, you both have touched sports and now you're continuing and you're, you're involved in, in training high performance athletes, but you're like, listen, you could be 70 years old and still b build muscle. Absolutely. Like one of my favorite, um, <clears throat> Instagram, uh, channels to follow really is string with Joan. Yeah. I'm sure you know her, right? She's amazing. Of course. I often think yeah. I'm like, how tall is Joan that she got that muscular? She's like, I know. <laughs> she's five feet tall. Cause that's the other uh, thing. People go, I don't want to get too big. I go, do you know how hard it is to get big? Like to oh build, gosh, you know, yeah. get bulky. If I could get bulky, then I would definitely have the hamstrings and the butt that I've always wanted. They're strong, but <laughs> you look at me and you're like, you're weenie. I say, yeah, I know. Cause you just can't build muscle. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the reminder, the period cycle, because you're the person that taught me about, you know, specific times of the cycle, you know, and for younger athletes to be working on skills versus developing power, even though boys could do that sooner. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we could just touch upon the little pockets of if you're a young athlete, uh, you know, the wisest approach 
to slowly integrating building strength? Yeah. So when we look at like the menstrual cycle, um, we see that the low hormone phase, which is day one of bleeding all the way through ovulation is when we're most stress resilient from an immune system point of view, from a cognitive point of view, from a recovery point of view. And so this is where, you know, if you feel good, this is where you can really push your limits. After ovulation, we have a, a change in our metabolism. We change in our core temperature. We also have a change in our immune system where the body becomes more pro-inflammatory because it doesn't want to have the immune system fight a fertilized egg. So this is where you're like, okay, well, how do I feel? Can I go really hard? Yeah, but I have to actually add in more carbohydrate and protein to hit those intensities. When we're looking at the few days before your period starts, we want people to think about that as kind of a deload. There are some women who feel like super bulletproof a few days before their period starts. Take advantage of those days, right? Because your hormones are already dropping. You just haven't started bleeding yet. And the over point of all of this is we're not 100% sure if you ovulate. So this is a thing that's coming up a lot now as we look at the research. Mm. It's like we see a greater amount of women who have anovulatory cycles and having fertility issues. And this is coming out of the fertility work and it, you know, environmental and stress and that kind of stuff. So there's a couple of apps out there that use urine dipstick to look for progesterone metabolite. So if you can really determine that you ovulated, then yeah, you can really dial it in. But for most people, that's not that accessible. So we say, let's really look at how you feel across your cycle. Let's use that subjective work as well as your objective. Maybe you have some wearables where you're looking at your heart rate variability, knowing that your heart rate variability drops after you ovulate right? because progesterone affects that. So there are ways of really seeing how you are affected by your hormones. And then for some people who are like, I'm just going to keep track of when I bleed. And the next time I bleed, it's like, well, let's, let's keep a little bit more tie into that. Because if you find days in your cycle where you feel bulletproof, you can maximize those training days. And then on days where you feel super flat, don't schedule a high intensity schedule recovery or an off day. So there's ways that you can really leverage those hormones and the way your body's responding to it and dial in your training according to your own rhythm. Yeah, I think it's it's so important because again, we we just go well. I have a schedule. It's like no, you we have to listen. <laughs> like yeah, no, but I planned on this. It's like uh huh, and today's mm -hmm. not the day for that. Or I wasn't planning on doing this, but wow, I feel great. I'm rested. Well, guess what? Today is the day for that. So it's it's yeah. it's it's also. I could get a program for you, but I'm still going to be the best person to understand how I'm feeling. Right. Yeah. And manipulate that program to work for you. Yeah. Which I think a lot of women are afraid to because they've been given a program and they're under the auspice that they have to follow it to the letter to get results. It's like, for the most part, it's a guide and you're going to get the best results when you listen to your body. So if yeah. you've been sick, you're not going to hammer it. If you're coming back from injury, then start back at the beginning of the program. If you're like, oh, I've got travel, well then manipulate that week to work with your travel. And that's how you're going to optimize those results. And you in your programs, like you'll have people who are haven't really worked on certain moves or compound moves or squatting. And you'll say, hey, listen, we're going to take the first couple of weeks to the first few months just to work on the moves and, yep. and getting the moves exactly. right safely. So w when we talk about all of this, especially lifting heavy or being explosive and dynamic, we're also talking about it from a, a place of like, and being really mindful about the way we're doing it and not being afraid to take time to, to learn something new. Right. Exactly. I tell women, we want to phase you in because again, this isn't a training program. This is how we want you to move and accommodate for the rest of your life. Yeah. We don't want you to get injured. We don't want you to be overwhelmed. We want to see how you move. We want to work your movement capacity and your range of motion before we add load. If you're like moving well, maybe we start with a backpack with some uh, a kettlebell in it and see how you you squat with that kind of a load before we throw a dumbbell in your hand or a barbell on your back. And it will take time to learn how to lift heavy properly. It could take a year and we're in it for the long haul. But along that year, you're getting a lot of neural adaptations. You're changing body comp. Your range of motion is improving. And then we can start putting in some heavy threes. 
So it, it is that eye, if it's not an immediacy, we want to make sure that your body's moving and accommodating because the last thing in the world I want is for someone to get injured or to hate movement. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really um, wonder because I, I deal with that when I train with especially women and even myself, it's, do you have anything, especially besides dealing with like hanging for time and in, just in, increasing that, or, you know, obviously when you lift, you get certain things that, that you're working on your grip strength, but this seems to be an interesting one for women is managing their grip strength. So yeah, how do you bring people along there? Because I'm, a, I'm, I'm selfishly asking because I, I try to, you know, I have work with a lot of my friends and have you even um, for people listening, you're not going to be able to see it, but have you ever seen how they try to offload the grip even by flexing their wrists back? Cause they mm -hmm. don't actually want to take like the full grip and the full load. Yep. Um, do you have little secrets for helping people get a relationship, especially women? But I think that this all pertains even to like hardworking or sedentary men that don't haven't started working out. Uh, or people like human beings. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you do to, to navigate a, and kind of address grip strength? Yep. Farmers carry. Yeah. Dumbbells and kettlebells, mm. because with the gravity pulling it down, you have to have your wrist straight and you have the hook grip. Yeah. So it's like the peace sign hook grip. Cause then I think there was a meme going around on social media that you should be able to carry 75% of your weight as a woman. And I think it's 85% of your weight as a man for a minute. So walking farmers carries it's like, okay, let's see that. And that's a, that's a, a, an aspect of grip strength and longevity. So it's teaching people that hook grip and farmers carry and relaxing to be able to get that grip strength and hold that weight. Um, yeah. And that's the fastest way that you can really develop that grip strength. And then you can get the hanging strength, but yeah. I work grip strength through farmer's carries a lot. I love that. We, we play a game here where we take Yeti pails and they fill them with water accordingly. Cause it's also moving and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll do it with the boys, but their buckets are all the way filled up and mine are, you know, less, but then we just start walking around and then add other things like hold your breath and you don't get to release until you get to the other side and just try to uh. play around. But then you're outside, like there's just some kind of fun game. So I, I also, yeah. you know, love the idea of playing, um, in all of that. Um, okay. Just, you know, something you, you were talking about that I also were, thought, oh, we have, we got to talk about this was, you know, at certain times, like, okay, let's talk about birth control, for example. Um, this is really tricky because if yeah. you have a teenager and there's a million reasons, right? If they're sexually active, their skin, uh, they want to, they're having painful periods, whatever it is. But now we're finally getting data on how tough this can really be on your health. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, if, if you have a, if you have a young athlete and they're sort of saying, Hey, my, my periods are never mind sexual activity and all these things, they're just my, my periods are really painful or what have you. What, how are you approaching this with your athletes? How are you going to approach it with your daughter? Like how, cause it's, it's tricky. Yeah, it is tricky. Um, so I know from a physiological standpoint, like how all the, contraceptions work. So I outline it and say, these are the things you need to ask your doctor. So if you're having really significant, painful periods that are putting you in bed and you can't get out, um, and it's heavy menstrual bleeding, which is really hard to quantify, you can go to your physician and you can get um, pomegranate extract, which works like tranamic acid. You can get an IUD. You can get a progestin only pill. There's lots of things that, to do to dampen inflammation and to dampen um, how much uterine lining is built and shed. So that's one thing to really consider. If we're looking at all the different types of oral contraceptive pill out there, they're experimental in their own right. It, and the progestin component is really important to understand. And I get frustrated still because there's the two ends of the spectrum, right? So you have a young girl who might have irregular, I, I don't really want to say irregular, but variability in their periods. And 
for the first about four and a half years after your first menstrual cycle, you're going to have variability. It doesn't warrant OCP use. It just means understanding that there's variability. And for bad skin, we have really good dermatologists. So the quick fix right now is for people to go to their physician to get put on an OC. But there's some research that came out at the beginning of the year looking at OC use and how it affects the development of the amygdala. So we see that women who are on an OC, it would have a shrinking effect of the amygdala. And then when they came off, it was reversible. But for young girls, we don't know because that's the development phase of the brain. So we want to be very cautious that these pharmaceutical agents and hormones, yes, they affect the body, but they affect the body differently than our natural ovarian hormones. So you need to have a really cognitive conversation with an endocrinologist if your GP doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And so if I have, like if my daughter was having really bad skin and heavy bleeds, then I would look at using pomegranate extract or looking at a way of using tranomatic acid to stop the bleed and then get her to a dermatologist because you know when she's 13 or 14 you're not going to say hey have an iud but then when she gets older and might become sexually active and mm -hmm. still having these issues mm -hmm. and wants to fit and forget so she can play sport and not have to worry about bleeding then we would consider an iud um, because then we don't have a down regulation of our ovarian hormones we can still keep track and if something it goes wrong there's an opportunity to check it so I'm very conscious about OCPs and how widely they're like passed out like Skittles, right? It and it's scary. No, for everything. These oral con uh, contraceptives are like, and, and I think that people think, oh, oh, I'm getting my period, but they don't realize. It's not a period. No. It's a withdrawal bleed. Yeah. And that's the rhetoric where a doctor will say, oh, here, I'll fix you and I'll give you a period. And they get an OC and it's like, that's not a period. That is a withdrawal bleed from synthetic hormones. It has no indication of your endocrine system or how your body is responding. There's no luteinizing hormone pulse, which is really important. And not only for endocrine health, but also for appetite control. So we see some of the side effects is a change in appetite and weight. And that's because there's a dysregulation of these synthetic hormones and your luteinizing hormone pulse. There's so many complicated complicated and complex responses that are never talked about. Mm -hmm. And it's not, like you said earlier, physicians are doing it in good faith, but they just don't have enough information. And it's a fault of the way the medical schools are and how you might have two one hour sessions on women's health and through your entire medical you know, like education. So if you really want to deep in, dig in and deep dive, you have to, to look upon yourself to do it. And I, I feel like if people can get educated with it and muddle through some of this complication, they'll, they'll understand how they can simplify it on the other end. It's like yeah, anything, once absolutely. you gain the understanding, you'll know how to simplify all of this. And, and that's why people like you are such incredible guides. So I brought up that you have, um, you, you have an adaptogen cheat sheet on your site, mm -hmm. I believe. Yep. Um, yep. you have books out, you have roar and next level, you have other programs. And is this, is this all on your website? Yep. All on the website. And in response to a lot of the stuff that we've had about parents going, what do I do with my teenage girl? We have a next gen course coming out in December. Great. So to answer all of the questions. So you, I am older than you, but you and I are kind of in that zone where, uh, you know, a lot of women, it, and it's become such, it's so interesting when something becomes a popular topic to talk about how for so long, no one's talked about menopause and that people go, well, it's just, that's the way it is. And, you know, you kind of got to suffer through it. I have a friend who jokes that said, we weren't really supposed to survive it. We were supposed to die anyway. You know, like we, uh, joke, we joke about that, but yeah, yeah. I, I was, I read something where when you become a teenager, right, your brain kind of shears or prunes itself, because you don't need to learn how to hold a cup or tie your shoe anymore. So it kind of prunes itself for other things. And that we sort mm -hmm. of go through something like that also during this time. And that part of the brain that gets sort of pruned off is caring what people think. Be is that why? I love it. <laughs> no, it's true. And, and that really what, because what we need to be doing as we become older and we're not biologically going to be producing children is sort of what do we need to do? What does we need to do for the greater good, which could be our families, our block, our community, but we sort of mm -hmm. move into this different role. 
And I know from having now teenage and young adult daughters, I like, I'm okay. Like I'm okay with it. I, I noticed the changes, right? Like it's just impossible not to notice the changes, but yeah. I'm okay with it. Cause there's other things. Um, but definitely feeling strong and healthy, I think enables me to sort of manage it not only emotionally better, but certainly physically. Um, yeah. But maybe you could just drive home the cognitive impact of all of these things we've been talking about for us as we get older. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff going out about how menopause changes the brain, right? And how, unfortunately, there's a pendulum that has swung that says MHT is what you should use to prevent dementia and Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. And there is no evidence for that. But what we look at, like I said, exercise is a stress, right? And so we're learning new pathways. We're getting new neural adaptations. And the other thing about doing things like sprint interval training and that high intensity is we're producing lactate. And the preferred fuel for the brain is lactate. And when we see this sex difference for Alzheimer and plaque development, taking out the APOE4 gene, which is a, a higher risk factor, doesn't mean you're going to get it. It just means you have a higher risk factor. If we look at improving our lactate metabolism, then we reduce those plaque developments because now we're not having a misstep in our glial cell conversations and neurons because the glial cells are really reliant on lactate. So the more we produce lactate, the more the brain uptakes it, prefers it, and uses it. Same with resistance training. So with resistance training, we're getting neural adaptations. And with neural adaptations, we're getting more conversations between the dendrites and the conversations between the neurons. Mm -hmm. Both of those are really, really important for preventing cognitive decline. So when we hear like the imaging of all these changes with the amygdala, especially around menopause, what they're not talking about is every month across the menstrual cycle, you have these changes like estrogen and progesterone affect the amygdala. And this is why we have changes in cognition throughout our menstrual cycle. We have times where we're more aggressive and confident. We have other times where we're a little bit more not so great, right? And it's because the way the brain changes, it's very plastic. So when we get to menopause and we don't have that effect of the hormones, right? We want to keep that diversity. So instead of sitting down and doing Sudoku, which is okay, we want to, you know, look at how we're improving brain metabolism through lactate production and how we're improving those dendrite conversations through resistance training. So again, it comes back to the brain. I'm all about the brain. How's the brain perceiving nutrition? How's the brain becoming plastic and really adapting to these responses? So again, so we can be a hundred and we are having not Zimmer frame races, but actual races with our friends and really cognizant in our conversations. Does any of it scare you? Absolutely. About, about getting older? Because when I say it's not freaking me out, it's, it isn't, but the idea of being old is interesting to me. Like, I'm like, oh, how am I going to, like, what's that going to look like? And I'll do all I can do now to make that as positive of an experience as I can. But I was just wondering as somebody who's in it and talking about it and so well aware of it for you personally, I really like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I am because I have longevity in my life. Like my grandmother, my mom's mom died last year at 105 and a half. So you're scared that you might go too long and what? <laughs> yeah, because I, I saw her life. Like she was really like she was doing pushups against the wall, right? When she's getting older and she's like, yeah. Stacy makes me do pushups. <laughs> I don't make her do pushups, but she was doing that and sit to stand like trying. She's living by herself. Then COVID hit and it all went to shit because then she was really isolated. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, but she lived through all of her friends. She lived through her kids' friends. Right. And so it's that social isolation. So I'm trying to get a whole bunch of like-minded women like you. And we're all doing this stuff together so that as we age and we get older, we still have community yeah. because I'm looking at like, I might be halfway through my life. Other people might be three quarters of the way through their life, but the other people are only halfway through. I want us all to be together, like talking and having fun and being mobile and not being in a nursing home, just kind of like, uh, I'm ready to die. Yeah. All right. Last question. Uh, I really, by the way, I really appreciate that point. You know, it, I think people don't realize, like, I understand muscles and attractiveness, but it's ultimately so you can enjoy and have the experience and connect and uh, take on new challenges and things like that. But the last question is, because again, these are things I, I, I selfishly am navigating. 
is some type of hormone replacement. Are you open? Like if you go, Hey, the body's just not making enough of that. And that would support, you know, recovery and sleep and all these things. Are, are you open-minded to uh, hormone replacement therapy? Yeah. And if so, how do you like for people to approach it? I look at it as a tool in the toolbox, right? What I don't like is like how doctors are saying OCP for every young girl. Mm. I don't like the rhetoric that's coming in that's saying that every woman needs to be on MHT. Because I have friends in the States who are cancer survivors and asking me who I know that would prescribe them MHT because their normal doctor is like, no, it's contraindicated. I was like, why do you want to be on it? Like, well, you know, I, I'm afraid for my brain. I was like, well, there's no evidence that it helps with dementia. So we have to be very careful why we want to use it, right? And it is definitely a tool in the toolbox. It's not something um, that stops aging because, again, it's a pharmaceutical. So it doesn't do the same thing in our body as natural production. We're not looking at high levels. We're looking at very low, steady levels. And it's enough to keep our body from having incredible joint pain and soft tissue injury and um, poor sleep and rage and mood disorder and all the things that can interfere with our daily life, right? So if you're like, I really want to explore this, you need to talk to someone that is in the know. You, you know, there's a few really good endocrinologists out there that can actually tell you what it is. Like Carla DiGiorgio out of Boston, she is an athlete herself. She's been active her whole life. She's a really good sports endocrinologist and she specializes in this area. Mm -hmm. So it's someone like that you'd want to talk to. There are quite a few of them throughout, yeah. but not just a general menopausal doctor because one, they're like, oh yeah, here's MHD. I was on a panel last week or the week before, and it was me and this woman who specializes in menopause and she's a doctor and she had her slides and she's has like exercise and lifestyle interventions. And she passed over. She says, Oh, you don't need to know about that because at our clinic, we just give hormones. And then people in the audience were like, can I be on it for my whole life? She's like, yeah, there's absolutely no reason to be on or to come off it. And I was like, hold up, hold up. Like, I just gave a presentation on all these things that you can do besides. And now you're telling women, no, go the easy way. It's like, you still have to put in the work. It's not giving you the free pass. So all the stuff that I talk about, you still have to put in, in order to get adaptation and change. But it is something that definitely will help with regards to daily life and how we are affected by these hormone fluctuations. And people don't realize, and I know it's uncomfortable, like doing that work is uncomfortable, but you feel proud of yourself. I think it makes us like ourselves more when yeah. we kick our own ass from time to time and try to make better choices. And I, I think that you can't measure that. And it's something you bring with you through your day and through your life and into your relationships. And so rather than shying away from it, it's learning how to do it and leaning into it. I, I think they'd be surprised how interesting it would make them feel about themselves. Yeah. Because on the flip side of that, I've gotten messages from friends who have now started listening and, and implementing things. And in the past week and a half, I think I've gotten four or five different DMs from friends and like, oh my God, I almost went down MHT, but I started implementing all these changes. I feel fantastic. Yeah. So I'm not going to go that route. And I'm like, great. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're willing to put in the work and see how that feels rather than going the pharmaceutical route. Yeah. It's a very polarized conversation now. Yeah, I, I guess. Whatever. They'll, yeah. they'll find a reason. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> you like sauna? If you had, if sauna. people had a choice that you'd say heat. And I, I feel like the Chinese are always kind of like heat, 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 but that, that, and, and not infrared, but just traditional heat from the inside out. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Cause that's how you get your adaptations, yep. right? When you're looking at infrared, it doesn't create the initial signaling that you need to start invoking all the changes. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, a finished sauna in our garage and I love it. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Stacy Sims, I could ask you a million questions, uh, but I'll save it for the next time that we talk. Okay. And if there's any last invitation, if I blew it in anything, if there was an invitation you'd want to make for women or for people in this space, um, what would that be? To try to ignore all the noise mm. and see how your body feels. And remember, don't be Wally, right? Don't be in the movie Wally. Just move. Just move and see how your body feels. Because once you take that first step, then 
I guess literally, if you take that first step and start challenging yourself, both mentally and physically, it's really interesting the the changes. Like, yeah, it's going to be hard, but I think we've gotten too complacent because we sit in rooms that are 70 degrees and, you know, we try to go places in our car so we can have that 70 degrees. We don't have to sweat. We don't have to move. And human body isn't designed to be that way. It's designed to have challenges to adapt. Can you just remind people all the places they can find you? Because you do offer a ton of information. Yeah. So our website um, is kind of like the catch all for everything. So that's drstacysims.com. The easy way, no E, no double M. And then Instagram, Dr. Stacy Sims. We are also on TikTok and Facebook. So trying to put information out three to four times a week and then have other things that go on the other days. So I try to be as responsive and as accessible as possible because it is the mission to get every woman to join me when we're all 80 to 100 yeah. playing and having fun. <laughs> I, I, I must laugh that sometimes you're like, I went to school and now I'm shooting content videos three or four times a week. And I'm having to say the same 20 things, 1000 different ways. So I really appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. The more you hear it, the more you apply it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. Awesome. Thanks. So thanks again for joining me and listening to The Gabby Reese Show. Make sure to like and subscribe so you never miss a conversation. And if anything showed up today that you find would be helpful to someone you know, pass it along and make sure to share with us what really resonated and stood out for you in this conversation. Thanks again for joining us. Keep going and I'll see you next time.